Hello, everyone. Welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for being uh, with us today. And I want to apologize for some technical challenges that Professor Hudson has overcame. And I'm very glad, you know, some people don't believe in it. Mercury retrograde, whatever, but things happen sometimes. That's life. Yes, yes. Mercury retrograde, Professor Hudson. That's right. I and did. solar eclipse. <laughs> solar eclipse coming on the 8th. So this will explain. But uh, of course, the guest who I have with me today for the third time, because I'm counting the special guest for sure, is Professor Michael Hudson, who is financial analyst and very distinguished research professor of economics. I'm very, very grateful, Professor, for your time, for our conversations today. Uh, before we start this live stream, I would like to ask you the best way to find your work and support your work. Well, I have my website at michael-hudson.com. I have all of the interviews with you uh, and other interviews on that site. Perfect. And all the links to Professor Hudson you can already find down below this video. And those of you who are watching uh, and appreciate the conversation and the guest, please make sure to hit this like, leave the comments down below, share your knowledge with us as well, share the video and check your subscription if you want to support my work. All the links you also have down below this video. So, Professor Hudson, where do I start? I think I will start with an article that I came across on April 1st. This was posted on uh, TASS website, which is a uh, Russian uh, information website. And it was about President Vladimir Putin, who instructed his government to ensure that Russia will enter into the top four of the world's largest economies. And this will be by March 31st, 2025. The government, government must report to the head of the, uh, on the progress. So here are my key points with this. This should be done by 2030. As I look at the list of the top economies in the world at this moment, right? Number one shows it's United States of America. Number two is China. Number three is Japan, number four, Germany, and number five is India. With my absolutely not professional approach to this, I'm not an expert, I'm not an analyst like yourself. I assumed since the German economy is going down and is very much kaput, is Russia going to be replacing German economy and will Russia ever be able to actually go higher as far as this? Maybe number two? I think that the uh, problem is the whole idea of GDP uh, is not really relevant at all. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it doesn't reflect economic well-being. It doesn't reflect uh, how much you're really growing. Uh, in the United States, the GDP includes all of the military, as, as if it's an overhead product, uh, all of the debt that you have, all of the private uh, borrowing uh, and debt service, all of the interest payments are counted as GDP. Uh, the, uh, in the United States, 18% of GDP is simply medical care because the Obamacare and the privatized medical care in America is so important. 7% uh, of GDP in, <coughs> GDP in America <coughs> is the increase in housing prices. Uh, as housing becomes more expensive in the United States, uh, it's counted as GNP. Uh, the way that Russia could increase its GDP uh, fast is to do what? <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> to do what it did in the Yeltsin period, to make a huge inflation. To, to, if, if, if Russia would increase the price of housing 10 times, that would help increase its GDP. If it would tell everybody that they owe 100,000 uh, rubles in debt uh, and have them uh, pay 10,000 rubles uh, every, uh, every month, that would increase their GDP. Obviously, Russia doesn't want to do that. Much of the GDP in the United States, in England, and now in Germany is, you can think of it as empty. 
TDP. It, it's not a product at all. They, uh, there was a long lobbying a political uh, fight in Congress when the bankers and the real estate owners uh, and essentially the the uh, right wing uh, economists said uh, we there is no such thing as unearned income uh, uh, that uh, landlords earn their income by producing a service. So all of the rent that, you, that they charge here, you find that added to GDP. The uh, the bank said, well, the banks pro provide a service when uh, you, if, you, if you have a credit card and you are late payment in it, your interest rate goes up from 20 percent to 30 percent or even higher. And that in, that penalty rate is counted as providing a financial service. That's GDP. When you pay rent to a landlord, and the average rent in the United States, is, in, in New York, where I live, the average rent is $5,500 a month. Russia could easily catch up if it would charge every Russian $55 a month, $5,500 $5, a month. Uh, but why would Russia want to do that? Uh, the, uh, what is growing in the West? And the way it calculates GDP is overhead. It's rent, it's medical care that's privatized, it's interest payments to the banks, uh, it's debt arrears. Uh, it, uh, and this is not actual uh, growth of production at all. So uh, I would just say, just ignore what's happening in GDP. The reality is you can look at how the Russian economy is actually doing. It can produce arms quickly, uh, much faster than the United States or Europe. It can provide living standards that are much higher. If you would look at the living standards of Russians compared to Americans and uh, English people, and right now Germany too, you'd find Russia is doing very well because it provides a lot of public, ser <coughs> public services. These are not counted as GDP in the West. So, <coughs> not, I'm sorry. We, we, uh, we were uh, talking earlier and it was, it was anxious. Uh, the fact is that it's best just to talk about how Russians are living, how Russian industry is uh, supplying the economy with goods and services and arms, and uh, be very specific and leave out general measures like GDP. There's a reason you don't know the details about it. it it's so complex that when I did a, a calculation of GDP, separating, separating out uh, actual production from overhead, it took me an entire year to make that uh, balance and to see uh, what was what and to take it apart and put it together again. Uh, most people cannot spend a year doing that. But if they did, they'd think, oh, my God, this is not uh, worthwhile. I'm working with people in the United Nations uh, that say that GDP is, is all uh, concerning things that are not product and do not belong in GDP. So uh, I would say uh, don't try to beat the West at, at its own game because its game is going downhill and you want to go uphill. Thank you, Professor. So here I have a question that I didn't prepare for you, but many questions are born from hearing the guest. You know, as NATO has a certain requirement for the countries that are the member states of NATO, right, to contribute a certain percentage of GDP to the militarization of the country. Poland has one of the highest spending on this, which is exceeding that uh, number they want about four percent if not over four percent so in this case particular case with nato how is this relevant how is this measured nato spending uh <laughs> the, i suppose they take the measure of gdp and say you have to spend uh, uh at least two percent uh of it on buying arms uh, or whatever you call uh military now, uh, the fact is, anything can be called military. Uh, but what the United States wants is for Europe 
to have to buy its arms from the United States. What uh, the uh, U.S. is telling its European NATO countries is you have to spend much more of your income uh, now re replacing all of the tanks and the bullets and the other uh, uh, arms uh, that you've uh, all sent to Ukraine. Now you've emptied it out. You have to rebuild your stocks because if you don't rebuild your stocks, Russia is going to be marching right through Germany right to the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, you have to have enough arms so that you can prevent Russia from uh, marching in because Russia really is jealous of how wonderful you're doing and it really wants to be part of Europe. That's the, the craziness uh, of, of NATO to begin with, uh, but the United States simply wants them to build up arms so that either they can buy, uh, buy from the United States and help Boeing and Raytheon and uh, the other uh, the other American arms uh, industry, or they can uh, make more arms and begin giving them to some country to fight Russia again. They can give them to Israel to fight the Arabs. They can give them to uh, someone in Central Asia to try to fight Russia. Uh, they could do uh, whatever they want. They essentially want Europe not to spend its income on new capital investment and production, not to spend it on raising living standards, but just to spend it on, on weaponry. Now, if the rate of Europe uh, growth is 2% a year, and if they spend this 2% on NATO, that means the request that NATO spend 2% means the European economy can stop growing, except for what it buys from the United States or except what it gives Ukraine and uh, fight it, fighting, uh, fighting Russia or China in other areas. So uh, if America wants uh, NATO to contribute to fighting uh, China and the China Sea or Taiwan, uh, that's what it's going to be. Uh, essentially, that demand for 2% means Europe will lose its sovereignty over what it is going to spend on uh, its its production. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you about debt. I have few countries here at the front of me with some numbers. I'm not sure again how accurate those numbers are. So as we speak now, United States debt is $34 trillion and in this information here, I know you just talk about GDP, however, I want to address it. And approximately 99% of GDP, and according to the CBO, uh, will steadily increase over the next 30 years. China's debt in 2023 was $12.58 trillion. That's what it says. Um, and China gross external debt was... 2.38 trillion dollars now russia in the latest reports again if this is correct russian national government debt reduced to 285.4 billion dollars in december 2023 and the country's nominal gdp reached uh, 494.7 in March 2023. I would like to ask you, Professor Hudson, how is that Russia was able to manage this level of debt um, in spite of the conflict in Ukraine, in spite of the sanctions, was one of the reasons because Russia was was building the gold supply and that's how it counterbalanced those sanctions? R Russia, you gave the actual numbers. Uh, I think a better way of looking at it is to look at uh, debt as a proportion. You can say proportion of GDP or proportion of national income. Russia has lowest proportion of debt to national income of any of the other countries you've mentioned. I think it's 12% of national income, as opposed to maybe 150% uh, for much of Europe and maybe 200% uh, for Japan. <coughs> so, 
So Russia has really no problem. Uh, the problem isn't that so much. It's uh, the ability to pay debts. Now, in the United States, the, uh, it faces two debt crises right now. The first debt crisis is commercial real estate. 40% of the commercial real estate, that means office buildings, factories, uh, not everything except housing. 40% uh, of this real estate uh, is uh, uh, de depleted. It's, uh, it's, it, 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 uh, it cannot pay uh, more than 40% of its debts. And all the, these debts of commercial real estate are coming due this year, 2024, and next year. That means that there's going to be a huge wave of default in commercial real estate, just like is occurring in China with Evergrande uh, and its other uh, real estate uh, uh, companies. Uh, you, uh, this is threatening to bring down the American banking system because if, if the banks uh, cannot collect on their mortgage debt, 80% of the bank uh, loans in America are real estate loans. And if the real estate loans are in arrears, then uh, the banks are going under. The GDP doesn't have anything to say about debt. It doesn't have to say uh, about banks, except it, it makes debt appear that it's good, not and a, and a product, not something that uh, is a burden. So uh, Russia, uh, by having a low debt to GDP, uh, has a low G, uh, much lower uh, GDP for this, but it doesn't have the financial uh, crisis in front of it that the United States does. Also, the United States uh, uh, government debt that uh, other countries hold in their monetary reserves, uh, the U.S. Treasury bonds and other uh, bonds that are held by Europeans, by Saudi Arabia, by China, uh, and that Russia used to hold before they were grabbed, uh, were uh, all uh, debts basically of the United States government. But the United States has already said, it's done the calculation. Uh, it'll take them at least 800 years to uh, repay this debt. And the fact is, this debt cannot be repaid. It's a debt that nobody expects to be repaid any more than if you're carrying rubles around in your pocket for spending at the store, uh, the government wouldn't, uh, all these rubles are technically debt of uh, the Russian uh, government and the central bank. Well, obviously, if the Russian central bank would uh, say, we're going to get rid of this debt, uh, we're going to uh, pay, uh, have no more rubles, uh, then you wouldn't have any money. Well, the United States has uh, treated the whole world that way. It says, yes, we have a huge government debt, but you can use that as money among yourselves. And the advantage for us if, you, if Russia and other countries will use the U.S. Treasury bonds and bank deposits as, as uh, your money, then we can grab this money. Uh, whenever you do something we don't want, we can grab your money, just like uh, England grabbed Venezuela's money, and America's threatening to grab uh, uh, Iran's money and any other country it doesn't like. So the fact is that much of this debt that the United States has is debt that won't be repaid. Uh, and yet other countries continue to hold U.S. Uh, US uh, uh, Treasury securities, even though they can't be paid. They're just uh, an IOU. If you, it's as if you would go to the store uh, and you'd buy some groceries, and you'd say, well, here's an IOU. And they'll say, well, what do we do with the IOU? Uh, how uh, can you pay it? And you'll say, well, no, I can't pay it because I don't have enough money to pay it. But maybe you can give the IOU to uh, the farmers who are bringing you eggs or, or meat. And then they can use this IOU as their uh, payment. And then uh, it'll never be repaid, but you can use it among yourself. That's the kind of uh, that is what is happening on the international balance of payments uh, uh, reserves of countries' central banks. Most of what central banks hold in U.S. dollars it has no more of a reality than the uh, U.S. dollars that Russia held that were all grabbed by European, by the NATO countries, uh, and by the United States. So uh, the, the problem is, uh, is the debt going to be repaid or not? 
Russia actually is in a much uh, sounder position vis-a-vis -vis debt uh, than uh, the Americans, where debt arrears are going up. People in America are not able to pay their credit card debt. So there's a default rate is rising. They're not able to pay their debt on automobiles to get to work. So default rates are rising on that. Uh, commercial mortgages, uh, the landlords cannot pay their debt to the bankers, to the mortgage bankers, and uh, all of their arrears are going up. So uh, you're having a real crisis uh, right now that uh, does not occur in Russia because it never financialized its economy so much. Uh, and the sanctions that America uh, imposed on Russia actually helped Russia because Russia, uh, any country that is sanctioned has to produce uh, the goods for itself. And Russia said, all right, if we can't buy fruits and vegetables and uh, other crops from the West, we'll grow them ourselves. Uh, if we can't buy cheese and dairy products from the West, well, we'll develop our own dairy industry. That's just what it's done. So it didn't need to import. It's been able to, it's large enough to be self-sufficient. So the sanctions against Russia have helped it become self-sufficient and uh, that has made its economy much more resilient than the uh, West German economies, uh, which uh, obviously uh, they cannot produce steel or industrial goods without Russian gas and uh, they can't afford to get uh, America's liquefied natural gas at four times as much of a price because the price of producing manufacturers would be so high that they couldn't compete with other countries and world markets anymore. So that uh, is basically the problem. Russia has avoided these problems uh, by being self-sufficient. Uh, it avoids the international breakdown of trade that's occurring now as a result of um, uh, the sanctions against the United States and the uh, moves by the global majority, the 85% of uh, the BRICS Plus, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and the Global South, all to be, uh, create a new mutual uh, trading and uh, investment and monetary area apart from the United States. So uh, again, uh, the, this break is coming because you're doing better than the United States, and that's because you don't have the kind of GDP that the United States has. Of You could call it poison GDP or overhead GDP, not real GDP. That's why the voters in the United States are uh, so unhappy with President Biden. President Biden says you should be happy. The GDP is going up. And the voters say, well, it's not going up for us. It's going up for uh, the 1% of the uh, financial and landlord class in the United States. But the, for the rest of us, it's going down. That's what you have to look at. Who gets the GDP? And in America, it's the top 10% has got all of the GDP growth since 2008. The 90% haven't shared in this GDP growth. So what does GDP even matter? For the Russians, I, I understand the statistics, uh, the Russian uh, uh, GDP growth has been pretty widely distributed. And most Russians are now living uh, much, much better than they were in the 1990s when they followed the American advice uh, under Yeltsin uh, to uh, make their economy a GDP type neoliberal economy. Uh, they've gone a different way. So if you're not playing the US neoliberal game, then don't try to use the measures of GDP or welfare that uh, uh, are used uh, by the West essentially to confuse people and make them think that they're doing well, even when they're not. Thank you, Professor Hudson. What you just said is what Andrei Martianov brings almost every single time when I have a live stream with him. <laughs> How the Russians are living right now in comparison to the 80s or 90s. Every time he, when he's on my channel, he reminds this, uh, this, this situation, the reality now. But I want to bring the question from the viewer now, so let me just open it up here. Does USA will try to pay its debt with a prolonged war with Russia and by draining Europe's resources? Would you like to address this question, Professor? Well, everybody thinks of the war in Ukraine as being a NATO war against Russia. Uh, and yet, if you look at the actual dynamics, uh, it's America's uh, uh, long-term strategy 
is to fight against China. Uh, Biden has said that in 10 years, China is going to be our enemy. We're going to be at war with it. Uh, so we're going to try to stop trade with China now uh, in order to uh, make um, uh, America protected so that when the war comes, the U.S. economy won't be disturbed when uh, we don't trade with the enemy anymore. Well, how do we get to 10 years uh, fighting with China? The first thing uh, the American said, uh, uh, strategist said, well, if we're going to fight with China, we want to break it away from Russia. We want to prevent Russia from supporting China. Uh, and uh, so we need to fight uh, uh, with Russia. And uh, the American idea is if you fought with Russia, the Russian people, when uh, they're bombed and attacked, would say, oh, NATO is attacking us. Let's have a different government who will do what America wants. And if we can just reelect Boris Yeltsin all over again, or someone like Yeltsin, who, someone who works for Britain's MI6 or for the United States uh, uh, CIA, someone like Navalny. If we can get somebody who really works for the United States and uh, will uh, do what America wants Russia to do, like the 1990s, then uh, we'll, be much, we'll be happy again because there won't be war. Well, that was the crazy American plan. But then the final plan is, well, if we're going to declare war against China and Russia, then what we really have to do is we have to secure our control over our own satellites. And so the, uh, the, uh, go the war with, with, uh, uh, against Russia that forced Russia to retaliate and protect its citizens in February 2022 went hand in hand with cutting off uh, gas, uh, the Nord Stream pipeline, with cutting off trade with Russia. And, uh, and the, re the result of that is the last three years has seen a war between America and NATO. Uh, uh, America has conquered Western Europe. There has been an economic war. And the sanctions against Russia and China to pre pre prepare for America's war against China have led America to say, we've got to uh, split Western Europe off from its uh, trade with uh, Russia and China, that we're making it prosperous. So essentially, uh, America has been able to lock uh, uh, not only Germany, but France and all of Europe into dependency on American uh, uh, gas, American oil, American products, and it's, re it's uh, replaced uh, Russia and uh, also China uh, with dependency on uh, the, uh, the United States. So you can look at what's been happening in the last three years. The war in Ukraine has really been a war for the United States to take over Europe, essentially by having Europe governed by NATO, not by elected officials, uh, and by uh, pro the pro-war parties in Europe. So uh, Annalisa uh, Baerbock, for instance, has said, uh, I don't care what the voters want. Uh, I'm going to fight for the United States war uh, against Russia. That's the war for civilization. It's uh, our civilization. It's what you would call barbarism, but what you call barbarism, the Americans call democracy. Uh, and uh, she said, I'm going to fight for democracy. And it's true, the voters don't want it, but uh, we've got to support NATO. So uh, somehow the United States has turned Western Europe into a military colony. Uh, and as uh, Europe spends its money, not only on gas and uh, uh, energy and other U.S. products, but above all, replenishing its army by buying American tanks, American planes, American arms, uh, you're going to have a, 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 the balance of payments of Europe is going to be uh, further and further in deficit. The euro is going to decline in value steadily against uh, the U.S. dollar and against other currencies. Uh, and America will have won the war essentially to absorb the European economy into an extension of uh, the U.S. economy. <laughs> and uh, that, that's that been the real, uh, real world effect. Uh, Russia has grown during the uh, last three years war. China's grown during the last three years war, despite its, its financial problems. Uh, 
Europe has not grown. So uh, if you just look at uh, what's happening and you say, well, okay, it's, you can hardly say it's an American-Russian war because Russia's grown, America's uh, uh, voters want to uh, get Biden out of office because they're uh, against uh, what's happening. There's been a fight over the refusal of the Republicans to uh, give, uh, spend any more money on Ukraine, meaning giving it to uh, to uh, the leaders, the kleptocrats in uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, and to uh, the U.S. arms makers. Uh, you, you can see who's really won, uh, won the war, and it is really a uh, a political a war for political control of the United States o over Europe. That's the effect. Professor Hudson, that was just so informative. I want to thank you for this. I have two more questions for you, but to everyone who's watching, what Professor just said, if you appreciate, please hit this like, because this ultimately is what's taking place in Europe. And as you know, I'm in Poland right now. We became, well, we we were not really sovereign here, I would say this way right, right away, but those are the colonies of United States at this point. So. NATO, in my opinion, please correct me, Professor Hudson, NATO is not going to save United States from falling. It's not going to happen because at this point with how much is the debt? $34 trillion. We have BRICS. We have inflation. And you know, Hemingway once said, one of my favorite authors, writers, he said, how the one goes broke? Very slowly. Okay, so I want to ask you here my oh, last question. Very slowly and then, yes. and then yes. And finally, right. How about the middle class? How about, I believe most of us who are here on this channel, the, the viewers, the audience who is watching us, those are people from the middle class. Um, what's going to happen to the middle class is the middle class going to completely disappear in the west in the western countries in the collective west and will russia be able to still have middle class how this will look like well i never liked the term middle class everybody's either a wage earner or uh, a businessman an employer uh and uh, uh, the middle class means a wage earner that has enough wages really to buy a home uh, in the United States, and I think in Europe too, uh, home ownership is what defines the middle class. You can afford your own home. Now, in the United States, since 2008, home ownership has uh, dropped uh, 10%. Uh, in 2008, 59% of Americans owned their own homes. Now, less than half Americans own their own homes. Uh, they've been uh, essentially the Obama administration foreclosed on them uh, because of the junk mortgages uh, that they were tricked into signing. Uh, Obama rescued the banks, not the homeowners, not the uh, uh, the mortgage debtors. Uh, so homeownership's uh, falling here. Uh, housing is falling in the United States. The uh, many former members of the middle class are not homeless. Are now homeless. Uh, the homelessness is growing in the United States very, very rapidly. Uh, if you take the subway, there are homeless people sleeping on the subway. Uh, there are. Uh, they're spreading uh, disease uh, th uh, through much of the uh, country. They're they're uh, they're hiding in the subways or sleeping in uh, caverns under the subways. It's, uh, uh, in California, uh, it's nicer weather, and they're all sleeping outside. So th the middle class is really disappearing in the United States. Uh, it's becoming once again homeowners, and if a homeowner, uh, there it, it's the it's uh, wage earners, and if a wage earner loses the hope of being able to accumulate savings, then it's not really middle class. The Federal Reserve says that half of Americans cannot raise more than $400 in an emergency, and half of Americans have zero net worth. Well, if you have zero net worth, are you really a member of the middle class? If you're renting your house, you have no savings, you have no net worth, but you have a lot of debt. That really is a travesty. 
of uh, being middle, middle class. The same thing is happening in England. Margaret Thatcher wiped out the middle class by essentially privatizing the council housing, the, the public housing, and uh, essentially making it a trading good. And uh, if in uh, Europe and America, housing is not to live in. Housing is to speculate and make financial gains in by uh, landlords buying the house, raising the rent. And uh, this is uh, what is causing legal fights throughout the United States. Uh, and in, in England, uh, the fact is that uh, most many of the London wage earners, if they still have a job, have to live so far outside of, Lin of London that there's nowhere for them to live in London. They have to live uh, where they uh, have to take an expensive a privatized train uh, to get into the city. Is that middle class? Uh, I don't think the word middle class has a meaning because they're being turned back into, uh, wage, into wage earners without any hope of rising. I think uh, I understand that in Russia, home ownership has been rising. I wish that when Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, de uh, defaulted, I wish that uh, the Soviet Union had given everybody who lived in an apartment the rights to that apartment, free and clear. They wouldn't have had later to borrow uh, money to buy an apartment. They would have just been given their apartment, just like the kleptocrats were given control of Gazprom, of uh, oil companies, of whatever uh, co industrial companies they managed. Uh, they, they gave everything to uh, the, uh, the, uh, the kleptocrats, but not to the citizenry at all. Russia has been curing that situation in the last few years. And Russian homo now uh, Russians are able to have homes and uh, be what they feel is a middle class. A middle class is, uh, means someone rising in status from more, uh, to get their own home, to develop savings of their own, uh, to uh, develop their self-sufficiency and resiliency. That's really what it means to be a, a middle class. And uh, Russia has been able to do it. Uh, the West has not been able to do. And that's exactly why uh, President Putin has so little interest in uh, in, in Europe. He, there's no uh, reason that Putin would want to invade Europe. What would he do? Would he have to take over all of the uh, uh, the pensions that uh, the European governments can't afford to pay? Would he have to rescue European industry? No one can can do that. All all uh, either Putin and anyone else can do is leave Europe alone to sink uh, until it finally makes a choice not to be an American satellite anymore. Uh, just as the Americans had a revolution against England in 1776. Uh, Europe is going to need at some point its own revolution to be free of uh, the United States and the Western Hemisphere and to join Eurasia. But uh, as I think uh, President Putin has said, that's uh, many decades in the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Professor Hudson. Can I ask you one more question that I didn't have for you? Thank you. Uh, but before I do, I would like to ask the viewers from Russia, because I, I have quite some viewers from Russia, which I appreciate very much. When I was visiting Russia, um, many times I've heard from my friends there, from people I know, that actually uh, Russian government wants people to buy land and property in Russia, and they are helping, you know, farmers to take to, to buy this property and to produce in Russia, to live there. Uh, which what you just said is actually exactly the case. I want to ask you, since you've mentioned that 50% of Americans have zero savings and a lot of people, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, are homeless, right? I want to know how the future of institutions like IRS in the United States will look like, because clearly those people, they in my opinion, are not able to pay the taxes. So what is the future of IRS? Uh, if they're a wage earner, the taxes are, are all withheld. At the time they get paid their wages, the employer pays the, uh, uh, the income tax uh, for them. So many people have already been paying the income tax month after month or week after week uh, as part of their paychecks. The paychecks include, here's what we've paid for the state and the federal uh, income tax. So that's not a problem. Uh, people, uh, the penalties for not paying your tax are so far 
uh, so heavy that uh, the taxpayer will borrow from a bank or they'll run into credit card debt or they'll have to cut back consumption in order to pay the taxes. And that's why living standards are falling uh, in, in the United States. Uh, but uh, taxes really come first. And uh, uh, the, the, there's not that much uh, 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 of a tax default. The defaults occur in the private sector, not uh, in uh, payments to the uh, public sector. How about the big corporations? Uh, the corporations are able to pay the tax. Uh, they're always able to uh, borrow from the banks and the corporations pay much lower tax. Uh, the richer you are in the United States, the lower your tax rate. So that if you're as rich as Donald Trump, if you, if, if you get a uh, hundred million dollars a year in real estate, you don't have to pay any tax. Uh, for decades, uh, if you look at the statistics uh, of the uh, National Income and Product Account, the uh, landlord uh, industry, the real estate corporate industry has paid almost zero income tax uh, ever since uh, 1945 because the uh, 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 tax rules permit uh, a real estate owner to pretend that they're losing money every year as their building depreciates. And it's as if, uh, uh, under President Reagan, they assumed that the building uh, was completely depreciated and worn out in seven and a half years. Uh, well, they've now stretched it out, so it's a little bit longer. But uh, as Donald Trump said, depreciation is wonderful. I don't have to pay any, any income tax because uh, we landlords uh, backed political candidates who rewrote the tax laws so that we don't have to pay income tax. And the oil industry, the mining industry doesn't have to pay income tax. Uh, the big uh, financial firms have to pay only very minimal uh, income tax. Uh, the tax uh, burden has been pushed on to wage earners in the United States and pushed on to small businesses in the United States that uh, employ half of the employment in America is small and medium-sized business. These are the businesses that have been closing down in the last few years as the big business, the big corporations have been taking over. So uh, the, uh, if you can't pay the tax, you go out of business and that's what's ha been happening in the United States. Thank you, Professor Hudson, so much for finding time for this conversation. I very, very much appreciate your knowledge and uh, bringing the truth you know, to the audience and sharing this with us. To everyone who is watching, all the links to find Professor are down below the live stream already. The website, the books, uh, Patreon account as well. You can support uh, Professor there. And I hope we connect soon. Uh, Professor Hudson, thank you so much. Stay well, safe in New York. Well, well, th thank you for asking the question, but are very important. Thank you. Thank you everyone for watching. Make sure to check your subscriptions, hit that like and until next time. Bye everyone.